My name is Sahti, and I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that is uh, both philosophical but also has uh, practical, clinical uh, uh, applications and importance. Uh, the work itself is a, is a spin off from uh, the background work, which is I'm interested in uh, understanding the nature of human and machine reasoning and how it all works and how do they uh, could cooperate um, in some ways. And, and this led to a collaboration with the co author of the paper. Donald Stanley, uh, who's a pathologist working in the main medical center, and he has a very long perspective to uh, the question of the nature of disease. Uh, uh, he has been performing autopsies over 50 years, uh, and he's been thinking about these questions uh, much more than I have. Uh, uh, so this is a, uh, I will report a paper that was published just two days ago in the Journal of uh, Evaluation in Clinical Practice. And uh, in that paper, um, we really do want to ask this. The big question is, what is a disease? How should we understand it? And in particular, the question is uh, the relationship between um, precision medicine and uh, the digital health in general, and data sciences uh, in relation to the broader question of the nature of disease. And we want to point out uh, a bit of a problem or a dilemma, uh, which we call an epistemological dilemma. It is not so much about the nature of the thing that we call disease as much as it has to do with the knowledge and the knowledge that uh, diagnosticians and clinicians have at their disposal uh, arising from using big data and, and recent technologies to help with the diagnosis and the selection of treatments and so forth. And the structure of the argument uh, really is uh, that if uh, diseases are what can be called natural kind, and I will explain that, then uh, precision medicine needs to be clarified or understood perhaps in a slightly different way from how we ordinarily think of that. Uh, because uh, it seems to follow that precision medicine tends to misclassify individual patients into subpopulations that are very heterogeneous uh, in terms of the nature of that disease that they have. Uh, it also uh, amounts to an epistemologically not very well-founded method uh, that is being amplified by possible biases that creep in when we use machine learning methods uh, that are rather well known to have biases of certain kinds. Uh, they work very well in certain domains, like imagery, uh, classification based on imagery. But there is a, always a danger of bias in that data. There is so much correlations, and they can be positive, they can be negative correlations, or they can be indifferent, neutral correlations. And we should somehow be able to distinguish uh, between all of these cases. Uh, and then, as a consequence from this, it might be that uh, if diseases are natural kinds, then precision medicine might be therapeutically less effective, uh, as it is well known that there is a resistance uh, to interventions of various kinds because of natural selection, the processes of evolution that the disease has. Uh, and, and this is, uh, of course, a very well known problem in many uh, uh, attempts to try to treat um, difficult uh, versions of, of, of various diseases. Uh, so what is precision medicine? Um, I think we really need to have a clearer understanding of the meaning of that commonly. It is understood as uh, an individual's health or state of their health that is measured at its basic units or data points. Uh, then the question really is what these basic units or data points are. And here the fundamental issue really is that 
these data points that we get from uh, big data machine learning uh, methods does not necessarily mean that these data points are the causes of the disease. So here is the question of what is the cause of the disease and how do we target the real causes, not only correlations, not only that soup that we get from positive, negative or indifferent correlations, but the real causes of the disease. So there is this mismatch in that. Uh, so uh, in short terms, personalization is not mechanization or mechanical application of data. Okay? We want to have personalized medicine. It, it works great in some cases, some cases less well so far. Uh, we want to have personalized medicine uh, because it takes this broader view on um, uh, the nature of disease, also taking into account person's lifestyle changes, conditions, environment, uh, history, uh, and so forth. And we want to treat the person and not the data points themselves, uh, especially when there is a mismatch between, you know, what is exactly a data point and what is the cause of the disease. Okay, so, so this is the structure of the argument. Uh, diseases as natural kinds. Okay. Um, now, uh, the, the argument was, remember, that if diseases are natural kinds, then these problems will follow. Uh, then the question is, are diseases natural kinds? So let's explore this a little bit further. Um, suppose that they are, now for the sake of the argument. Uh, we know that diseases, they tend to adapt to interventions. Uh, very efficiently uh, through evolutionary processes, anything from an, an antimicrobial resistance to refactory uh, thera uh, therapeutic interventions to uh, various forms of, of, of cancer, um, including targeted uh, medicine uh, as well. So in um, you know, just a matter of days or weeks, any precision medicine treatment that targets certain antigens might become ineffectual because of this um, resistance. And that could be explained by, by accepting that diseases are natural phenomena and should be classified as such. Uh, now, precision medicine tries to understand the nature of disease, uh, but from the understanding of the nature of disease to finding effective treatment options is a difficult transition. So the question is how to do that better. Uh, we want to take advantage of the survival distributions. Uh, each disease is a unique kind. In some ways, there is always a unique environment, always unique markers uh, uh, to be targeted. Uh, so how to generalize from that? So there's the question of generalization from the data that we have. Okay, uh, and in this paper, we provide uh, several examples and cases of how diseases and treatments uh, uh, as natural kinds, this uh, disease will re resist the interventions of various kinds. So, uh, for example, take a non-small uh, cell lung cancer uh, as an example, uh, which is you know, we have various options for treatment of that. Uh, but if it comes to immunotherapeutic options, for example, uh, each case seems to be so unique that, uh, you know, a unique drug should be developed for almost each uh, patient uh, individually. And that is not very viable uh, from economic, from ethical points of view. Um, and so, uh, this, is, this is one of the cases that we, we look into. And it's also very important because, you know, this, these types of lung cancer used to have a, a bit of a stigma uh, of, of, you know, uh, treating um, uh, because, you know, it, it, it used to be uh, for smokers specifically to have these this, this kinds of uh, uh, disease uh, as it has turned out just a few years ago. Uh, more than a half of the women who have 
non-small cell lung cancer will in fact be non-smokers. So there are other reasons that have, have meant to increase in that. Um, CAR T therapy uh, with very expensive uh, uh, precision medication, nearly almost half a million US dollars for a single shot, especially if you need to target some uh, CD30, very specific types of antigens. Uh, how do we get those? you know, to hospitals, how can that be distributed to those who are in the need of that? They are not even covered by normal insurance policies because of uh, the, that, that price tag that they have. Okay, and there are many other examples here. But then the question is, are the diseases in fact natural kinds? Um, what are the natural kinds? So let's go back to that. Uh, anything that is a natural category in the world, Okay, species, cats and dogs, flamingos, uh, natural kinds. They evolved to be what they are because of the nature of those things. Okay, so that's what's understood by a natural kind. Organisms that fulfill the imperative to exist, to survive. Uh, organisms, it could be a subpart of the or organism. And now you could think of disease as that kind of an organism that has its own existential imperative to survive. A cancer multiplies beyond the Hayflick limit and never stops cell divisions. And it's a natural process um, in that sense, also a natural kind. Some homeostatic consistency is required uh, for open systems uh, to maintain their state of survival. Uh, there is a natural, some naturalness in the ways how we group and classify things under certain classes and categories. And this is a very helpful, good thing to have because of, you know, we need these diagnostics uh, manuals uh, uh, to perform work. So it helps in classification. But there are also problems, uh, counterexamples that have been presented. Uh, how about diseases that evolve? Uh, are they, they natural kinds, something that doesn't have a, any particular state itself, but that state is, is dynamic um, and, and, and always evolving according to, you know, processes for natural uh, selection. Uh, but natural kinds uh, are usually thought in the broader sense, so that anything that has to do with processes is also a natural kind. It doesn't have to be a thing itself, but a process or a transition between states and that could also be a natural kind, as the, you know, transition between health and non-health and how that transition happens. That could be conceived as a, as a natural kind and could be classified accordingly. And some have proposed that mental illnesses are not natural kinds, so not all the diseases are natural kinds. Question is open, I think. Um, uh, we should remember that also mental illnesses can be classified in terms of the properties that they have. There are lots of invariant properties uh, in mental illnesses, although we often talk about the spectrum of, of, of autism or ADHD comes in various degrees and so on, but there are some common properties there. And uh, we can use inferences based on those properties. There are some certain laws that these, these illnesses obey, hierarchies that can be organized, so in a way, it depends on the science, whether we are finding more and more causes for mental illnesses, for example, the way endocrine system interacts with the immune system and more is being discovered there as the reason for many types of mental illnesses. So I think the case is a bit open, whether all diseases are, uh, count as natural kinds, but at least we could safely say that somatic diseases may be indeed are natural kinds, maybe all diseases are natural kinds. Okay, so um, what are the consequences of um, thinking of precision medicine as uh, somehow uh, not a natural kind uh, uh, phenomena? Uh, when it comes to the disease that we try to treat. Uh, 
we might have to give up some traditional classifications. If everything is, is, is um, targeted based on certain data points, uh, what happens with the classification in terms of infectious diseases, parasitic diseases, malignant tumors, uh, congenital disease, uh, uh, in this precision approach, is disease subtype becomes its own class. The idea of, of the classification was to help in work uh, of the clinicians and diagnosticians, but if each subtype becomes its own class, we don't see to get much aid from uh, attempted classifications. Each patient presents a separate distinct disease. Um, uh, can we generalize based on finding some primary data points, so much so that we can treat larger number of, of people having conditions of similar kinds? Um, what happens with the biases when we try to find the balance between uh, the type 1 and type 2 errors? And what happens with the RCTs, randomized controlled trials? Uh, if we have problems of generalization based on the data that we have, okay, do we get enough uh, patients and people to enroll in these trials that are typically, you know, you need multi-billion companies to perform. They're extremely large and expensive then. Um, so from all of these, you know, follows several economic, ethical, public health issues. Uh, so uh, just to end this here, and I'm uh, looking forward to your comments and questions and concerns. Uh, now, the idea of natural kinds is very old, so it goes back to our inheritance in, in the ancient uh, Greek philosophers, and Plato said that we carve nature at its joints, an idea that has turned out to be rather powerful in understanding nature. Uh, so let's, let's just say that let's carve disease in the context of, of uh, medicine at its joints in the patient and not uh, as data points. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, indeed, it was really different, and uh, it was a little bit philosophical anyway. So, um, you know, doctors have very concrete type of thinking, so they are very practical always. So I, I really enjoyed your comment about uh, causality and the confounding and cause and effect. So um, in general terms, um, uh, maybe you give a hint or a, a good example how in everyday practice we tend to forget that uh, uh, that uh, uh, things that happen you know in, in certain order are not necessarily causally related just temporarily yeah that, that's right and 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 generally as we all learn is that correlation is not causation exactly and if we could find the causes of diseases that would be great so most often they have to work with statistical correlations of, of various kinds. And then the, the, the connected question is, uh, are we treating the symptoms or are we treating or trying to find the, really the causes of the disease? And of course, the latter is, is the difficult one. Um, and precision medicine has proposed to, you know, to be able to answer that in some ways. But it's not easy and it, it involves all sorts of problems, I think clarification of the meaning of disease is needed first before we can make headway with that question. Um, just to give an you know, example, for example, you know, this uh, non-small cell lung cancers are uh, treated by immunotherapeutic drugs like um, nivolumab, uh, Optivo. Uh, it, it used to be the case that you have to have um, have uh, PD-1, PDL-1 markers, certain types of protein structures, you know, is that, you know, the first look for those. And if you have those, then give that, you know, you might prescribe that. And it may or may not help if you are lucky and you, are, you fall within the, that 5% that benefits from the treatment. So, okay, but it turned out that those markers uh, don't really mean much. So you could prescribe without those. You don't need to take the tests uh, to look for these antigens. 
uh, you could prescribe the drug anyway. It may or may not help to some extent. Yeah. So the, the, the identifying the cause seems to be a hard problem. Yeah. So, so I think it's a really good reminder that our drive to, 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 to uh, have the specialized medicine and pre precision medicine, uh, but we have all this knowledge from general uh, randomized controlled trials and uh, these medications work. So, so maybe I think it was a really uh, very, very good reminder that, uh, that uh, something that is behind is also quite important and not the, all of these things that seem to be on our head. Anyway, thank you so much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.